Um, hi, I'm uh, Stefan Magdalinski from uh, um, th uh, the Firecode Foundation. Uh, I'm going to talk about how do we build a good, kind, accessible D-Web. Um, a bit about who I am. Uh, I'm responsible for a bunch of, I have this slightly odd job title, Senior Tech Lead. Um, it's probably the most junior job title I've had in about 20 years, but um, it is what it is. I'm responsible for a bunch of different things at the foundation. I oversee our dev grants program, so you can come and ask me for money. Um, uh, but I also, and the main thing I'm going to talk about here is I lead uh, what we call the user experience improvement team, which is a small gang of um, uh, uh, people who basically across the Firecoin network and across the Firecoin ecosystem try and do small interventions and user research tests to give kind of quick feedback and help improve our tutorials, our documentation, our applications, our command line tools, the, the whole works. Um, prior to that, uh, I've been building internet things since about 1994. Yes, I am showing off. Um, and for many years, I was an engineer who kept building content management systems and tools that were really feature rich and really complicated and that nobody could use. And so in about 1996, I got this kind of usability bug um, and uh, built something that people really loved using and they mainly loved using it because we stripped out everything and we made it very simple and we made it very self-explanatory. Many of the things I built are no longer standing, but the one uh, you may have heard of that I still get to dine out on quite a lot, and the one for which I won the Webby, uh, is a, a digital printing business called Moo.com. Um, quite a few people here soft don't have um, uh, Moo cards. Um, I was a co-founder of that. Yeah, woo! I'm, I, I left in 2009, and I'm still 14 years later, like you know, taking credit for it. So. Um, uh, so what do we believe in at the foundation? I think this will not be uh, so revolutionary to this particular audience because I'm sure we believe in the same, all in the same things. So we believe in preserving humanity's most important information, um, public goods in the public domain, uh, the promise of the internet as an open platform, and for me specifically, very much for everybody. So for citizens, for consumers, for um, everybody in every nation on this earth. Um, if the things we're building don't have mass appeal, um, I do not think we will have succeeded and I don't really will understand what the point is. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about, and uh, with my colleagues over there, the future of the digital public domain. So what does digital open space look like in 20 years or 50 years time? Um, what happens, and this is one that exercises me quite a lot, all this content that was being created right now that's on Facebook, on Twitter, on uh, Flickr, or on any of these photo sharing sites, everything you put online, at some point that is gonna pass out of copyright and into the public domain. And then there's a bunch of questions about what happens then. So I have this theory that the, uh, the new Disneys of the world, the new content maximalists who will be arguing for copyright extension in 20 or 50 years time or whenever it is, is gonna be Facebook because they will want to carry on asserting their rights over um, that what should be that public data. But there's also an issue around what happens with archiving and bit rot, and we can talk about this, you know, with all of those things. But there's also, I think, an issue around privacy, especially with photos. So if you look at big photo archives from 100 years ago, they don't have any metadata associated with them. Uh, they, you know, they're just there. They can't really lead to, to, to any um, privacy violations. Now, pictures not only have the metadata that was saved with them when they were taken, but they also can have metadata retroactively applied to them by using AI tools to figure out exactly where it was taken or whether somebody is a family member of somebody is possibly in a different generation, I think is something we're gonna be able to do in just a few years time. So facial and geo recognition change the privacy landscape for archives and things in the future. Um, so, but you know, building the kind D-Web, uh, that's sort of a bit of the background. This is the, what I really came to talk about. Um, I want to talk about history a little bit because I think I, I came into the D-Web about 18 months ago and I've had some strange conversations with people where they kind of misunderstand how we got to where we are now, right? So that the, 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 it was our plan that we were going to make five companies the gatekeepers to the whole of humanity's information. That was not our plan. That was not the plan in the World Wide Web. In the World Wide Web, we were decentralizing, we were giving power back to the, the citizenry. We were fighting Rupert Murdoch and we were fighting broadcast TV. Um, and uh, um, uh, you know, we were hugely optimistic about the promise of self-publishing. We thought everyone would run their own website. We were gonna defeat decentralized broadcast media. Um, um, you could argue that the, that the media itself has massively decentralized, but somehow the money has not done so. Um, in, um, and, you know, Web 2 came along. I was also part of the initial bit of Web, Web, Web 2.0. It actually started off really well. 
Um, and I think we were massively, collectively super excited about the sharing and suddenly everybody was publishing and was sharing content and creating stuff. We kind of forget now that a big part of what we believed in in 2007 was that, was that there was, this would be all about interoperability and openness and you know, via APIs. And lots and lots of small websites would be where people were publishing, they were all communica communicating. We failed to spot the rush towards centralization on these platforms until it was actually too late, but it was not where we originally started off. The FANGs um, were kind of an emergent property, not the objective. Um, and well, actually, maybe Facebook always had that objective. I, I don't know. I certainly knew people at Google who, you know, if you remember, don't be evil. They were, they, 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 they thought they were not on. They were on the side of the light at one point. Um, the actually, I think the original AdWords model was was really beautiful in the alignment of what users were searching for, and returning them advertising that was suddenly relevant for them for the first time. That is no longer the case because the advertising is now trying to sell people stuff that isn't in their interest, no matter how much they tell us that there is. And that, you know, it's basically, it's now out of alignment. Um, how do we fix this? Decentralized tech is only a part of this, right? So I slightly different view because I come from Europe and I think the GDPR is great. Um, uh, uh, it, it's not the end, it's only the beginning and it's gonna be a slow process and malicious compliance uh, schemes, uh, you know, all of this stuff with these crazy cookie banners and things is gonna get unpicked. Um, it's obvious that we're seeing a, a uh, um, uh, we've got a massive monopoly situation and the antitrust is gonna be really important, um, but these things are gonna take a long time. Um, what will stop us? The incumbents are very much at the ignoring a stage of, uh, of, of this project, right? So, um, and you know, we can be all very idealistic here, but we have to remember that at some point they're gonna start paying attention to us and then they have a lot of money and a lot of power. And um, you know, we are, uh, idealists, you know, I think we're Danny, uh, Danny O'Brien, my colleague, sometimes says that we're we're at the 1983 TCP/IP being uh, put onto ARPANET stage of this, not the sort of 1997, uh, the D-Web getting the, the internet getting mass adoption stage. Um, decentralization is really hard, right? It, there is just a uh, additional cost and um, uh, comms overhead from doing the coordination. Um, uh, there's a very strong draw to make, you know, it's just easier to make services that are centralized. Uh, and, you know, there's this whole issue around how you do trust and safety and prevent online harms in a decentralized world. And I think if we don't, if we make the same mistakes that the Web2 world has made around trust and safety and online harms, then we will have failed. Um, and, you know, we have to make sure people care in theory. Like I talk to a lot of people who are not in this community and who are, you know, in just, just normal people and they hate Facebook and they hate these, you know, all of these things and they hate being spied on and they hate the web being slow and they hate banner ads. Um, but unless we build something that is more useful and comprehensible, we will not bring them along and we will not achieve mass adoption. And that brings me to um, what I'm really here to talk about, which is usability. And um, I, Many years ago, I had a blog, and the subtitle of the blog was Survivor of the Easiest, um, which uh, um, came about because back in, the, in those days, I kept seeing that no matter who had the money, whether it was Barnes & Noble versus Amazon or, or you know, the incumbents, no matter how, what resources they could throw at it, they would always get beaten by the site that was easiest to use. And we are in a, when you're going for like consumer mind attention, you are in a uh, a competitive landscape of like, can you help them answer their question? Can you help them achieve their goal? Can you give them an enjoyable experience? Can you not give them an error message that makes them feel like they're stupid when actually it's you that's been stupid by not giving them a friendly error message or giving them an error in the first place? And I think we kind of forget that the, these giants grew so big by being the place where you could most easily connect with your friends or most easily find the answer to what you were looking for. Google was not the first engine. We had Hotbot and we had AltaVista and we had a whole bunch of things before it. Google just was the one that gave better answers and had a nice simple box that people could understand. Um, and I believe that like nothing about this usability landscape and this environment and this principle is any different for, for, for the D-Web and, and Web3. Like we are still gonna, if we don't build things that are easier to use, we will lose. The easier sites will continue to win. Um, so, where are we in the current state of the D-Web? Um, well, we are, it's early days, so we are very, very tech-led. We are not user-focused. We uh, celebrate, like, we're having long discussions around protocols and about, you know, building little prototypes and stuff. We also, we have this thing, we hate surveilling our users. A lot of us are here 
because we, we hate surveillance capitalism. And I, I'll, I'll talk about that for quite a bit more uh, later on. Um, but you, yeah, so, and then we have actually, I think, um, a dependence on some pretty poor frameworks. I'm not going to name them, but like, you know, I see a lot of, I, with, with the work I do with uh, the award giving, I have a lot of people coming to me, I've built this website, and I look at a lot of websites that people have put out there. They all use the same frameworks, and the frameworks, I think, are like the, they're the, they're, they're the sort of the front page WYSIWYG editors of the modern world, right? So uh, they, they, they produce pretty output. You can throw something out really quickly. They are bloated, they are slow, they are inaccessible, uh, they have bad defaults, and they all look the same. Um, uh, so um, that's kind of where I think we are right now. Uh, five, five, so, sorry, <laughs> I don't, not you guys. Um, these are, they're, they're actually also not really things that I think that I hate about Web3. I think that, I think these are things that, um, and, and this is the bit where I start to feel bad about sort of like being a, an old Web1 guy, being a grumpy and like complaining everyone. I just think these are things that I see us making same mistakes that we made in the two previous iterations of the web. Not everyone makes these mistakes, but far too many people do. And like um, uh, enough for me to get like really angry in the middle of the night and slightly drunkenly hammer out a, a, a talk description and end up standing here. I, I actually had a version of this talk where I, I actually was going to litter it with like calling out websites and things, and then I realized that would just be mean. Um, but I think you can all imagine and you'll understand that, what I'm talking about. So some of these things are really basic, and I sort of can't believe that I think probably some of these were in presentations that I gave in 1997, and I can't believe I'm saying them again, but until I see them get better, I'm gonna keep standing up and just getting grayer and grumpier. Um, universal resource locators, they are a gift. Um, uh, along with, I, I wish Tim was still here, um, but he, he wandered off before I started talking. They are the core of the open web, right? So the ability to share, the ability to, um, Actually, along with view source, right? And uh, there's two things that, that, that browser manufacturers have been slowly trying to deprecate year, uh, year after year after year. One, they hid view source behind a developer menu and they you know, keep trying to make it harder to see. Uh, and then URLs, the other one, we're going, oh, we're just gonna make it easy so that you can't see this thing. It's too complicated for users. I've never seen any user testing where people, they don't, you know, they may not be able to parse it themselves, but they do understand how to copy and paste it. Um, and uh, I think it's a clue that URLs and view source are on the side of the light because of the fact that the Chrome and the browser uh, and Apple were basically keep trying to hide them away so much and try and move us away from, from this open web. If your content is stateful but doesn't have any personally identifiable information, uh, identifiable information um, write the variables into the URL so that someone can copy it, can share it, um, can link to it. Um, don't do a single page application unless you can do some clever thing where you're making sure that the, the stateful parts are written back into the URL. Um, don't use an HTTP post when you should do a GET. Um, we have a site in our network that is a search engine that uses posts. So if you do a search and then you want to share the results of that research with someone else, you can't. You have to go and tell them to re-enter the same query. URLs, like I said, the fundamental union of sharing, community, virality, memedom, indexing, and archiving. The Internet Archive needs your stateful URLs if it's going to index your site and index your content and preserve it for forevermore. Don't break them. 404s. I mean, I really can't believe I'm saying this. Uh, uh, this has become a Web3 anti-pan. Um, I think we, not just 404s, but you know, also 500 and things. Do not redirect your 404 silently to your homepage. It's like you're sort of like ashamed of the fact that you've got a, a, an error. Actually, 404s are a, a kindness to your users and they're, a, a kind, they're actually a kindness to yourself. Um, often a 404 won't be your mistake. It's the person who's linking to you who's fat fingered it. Um, and, um, uh, but it's incredibly jarring for users. They follow the link and suddenly they're on their homepage. It's doubly jarring when they're doing it on, the ho on, on a mobile. They cannot see what went wrong. If they get taken to a page that says, hey, we couldn't find that thing you were looking for, one tiny fraction of a percent of them will go, ah, oh, and copy and paste that and send it to your support people. Or you can write a thing that scans the site and you will get useful, meaningful feedback. Um, and don't forget to look at your error logs regularly. I mean, I, I, yeah, like I said, I'm sort of surprised that I have to stand up and say this one, but I probably see it on 20, 30% of the Web3 sites that, that, that I look at. Um, now, um, observing your users, uh, this is really what I'm you know, here to talk about. 
I'm in the 99.9999% of surveillance capitalism haters. I, I'm in that percentile. I think all advertising is malware. I think user tracking across the web is an abomination and we have to eliminate it. Uh, I think <laughs> I run a pie hole everywhere in, uh, in, in my house, um, it's, uh, and, and you should too. 60% of our page loads and bandwidth is being stolen from us by this nonsense. But, and uh, this came out because, um, uh, again, I'm going to start talking to people. I'm going like, well, you know, you're having a problem with your website. Um, have you looked at your logs? And having people go, oh, we don't, we don't look at our logs. That would be spying on our users. Um, there has to be a point where it isn't spying to observe in aggregate where your users are struggling, where they're having problems, where they're running into bugs, and then using that data to make their experience better. There is a difference between that and using you know, a cookie to track your users over uh, uh, um, the, you know, the next five years of the web in order to try and sell them things that they don't want. Um, but there has to be a balance, and I feel very comfortable um, being uh, uh, with looking at what people are up to in aggregate. I think there's a historical thing that's happened here, um, which is um, we've kind of ended up at this, logs was sort of the foundation of surveillance capitalism, but they didn't really need to be. Um, I did human computer interaction in the days, sort of at the very b beginning of the web. And in, you know, if you, when you distributed software, it was on CD, the only per, the, you know, piece of Windows 3.1 application, you had to get some people into a room, you had to observe them using the software, you made video recordings of them doing it, and then you, you, know, you press the CD, you sent it off, uh, and you kind of prayed, because you would never get any more feedback about what people did. Um, the early days of the web, we had these two files, your HTTP access log and the HTTP error log, and suddenly, every day, you could see where people when they, where they were doing well, where you were getting more traffic, where they were falling over. And we kind of underestimate like how amazingly transformative and how empowering it was to be able to see that data in real time. We used to look at our access logs and our error logs every day. Um, and, um, and then, you know, that, that with, again, with view source and URLs was how the web got really good. Um, so, but we got to this point where trawling and mining your own logs um, uh, got kind of tricky because you know, hard disk space was kind of constrained. If you became really popular, I mean, I literally worked on sites where the, the, the log storage became an issue because disk space was so expensive. Um, and then, you know, these, these nice guys at Google had built this really nice search engine that, you know, was you know, very much on the don't be evil side. So we've got this new tool. It's called Google Analytics and it's pretty basic, right? All it does is it, it, it tells you how, you know, how many visitors came, you know, where, do they, where do they get stuck, where the stuff, and it's great. I don't have to maintain my own logs anymore. Google Analytics back then was not the monster of surveillance capitalism that it has become now. And it's kind of weird, like I've sort of come back to it and trying to use GA now, it's like it's impossible to find the sort of the basic metrics that we use then. It's all about like, here's these tracking things, here's setting up some really complicated, you know, just um, parameters. But we have, we, and as a result of that, we've kind of lost the very basic tools that we use to do the observation of our users and, 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 and to feed, to do these iterative improvement loops. I think we have this huge open question here, especially when we're building decentralized systems, how we do that kind of user observation in a way that makes sense when we've built this you know, fully decentralized environment. And I don't think, I certainly do not have a good answer to that question at this point in time. I don't know whether we do it, whether we can do it by better instrumentation on the client side or whatever, we just, I think it's, not only an unsolved problem, but an unsolved, a, a one that no one is thinking hard enough about. And I would love to have a conversation about it. Um, just on, um, uh, on how you actually do observation, um, observe what people do, not what they say. I'm talking about surveys here. Like surveys are literally the worst tool for making websites better. Like people have terrible recall after the fact. They try very hard to please people. And it's actually just, it's really impossible to design a survey that can capture the nuance of where people are, um, are, are having trouble and finding uh, and getting stuck. Um, the flip side of that is that observation is actually getting really quite easy. Like it used to be the case, um, I used to take developers, everyone in my development team, uh, when we were doing Moo, we'd take them to a, uh, uh, a company called Flow, who had a, you know, a magic mirror room with a sort of fake living room in it, and we would, you know, get, pull some people in off the street and get them to use our website. And um, uh, uh, <laughs> the developers would like stand up and start banging on the glass, going, "It's there! Can't you see? The button's right there!" <laughs> um, uh, and um, 
uh, you don't really need to do that anymore. Um, mainly a sort of mixture of uh, actually, you know, Zoom, the video recording tools you can do in YouTube, things like that. The good news also about observation and actually observing users doing stuff is that, as Jacob Nielsen taught us, anyone remember Jacob Nielsen? Oh. Um, uh, he's not dead, <laughs> just, <laughs> just quieter. Um, uh, taught us back in 1996. You can get like 90% of the improvement that you, know, you, you can transform the way people use your tool on your website by watching the first five or six users go through that process of just trying to, trying to do it. You'll figure out what language they don't understand. You'll figure out where, why they can't see the button. You'll figure out all, all of these things. Um, uh, I just want to show, I've got, look, I've got an actual image in my, in my slide. This is a tool that we've been sort of um, prototyping, iterating on ourselves um, uh, in, in trying to do remote tests in a decentralized organization. Uh, it's actually, it's, it's pretty simple. It's just a mirror board with some screenshots of a uh, process flow that we're trying to user test. And then on the left-hand side, we have a little stack of Miro Post-it notes and everyone puts that we get like 10 people together in a Zoom call who, haven't, who aren't the developers of the tool. The developers of the tool are not allowed in the room when we do this because um, uh, guiding the witness doesn't help. Um, uh, and somebody, a, a user puts their name on the Post-it note and then in the, on their device tries to go Try, you know, tries to follow the process, tries to follow it through. And we just keep it very free form. If you get stuck, stick a post-it note on the same page on the screenshot of where you got stuck. If there's a, if there's a you'll see the, the black bits of people, this is testing a command line tool and the, 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 we have some uh, uh, terminal window grabs and we just keep it very, very fast. Like if you, anything you don't understand, stick it down. Um, we now run these uh, uh, and it's turned out to be it's, it, I was originally, it's like, I, although I came up with that, I was like, this a little bit too informal um, uh, as, a, as a way of doing this capture. But it actually, we run these sessions every couple of weeks, and it's, as we iterate over it, it's proving to be a really, really good way of being able to do user testing and gathering a lot of data um, uh, 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 very quickly um, with remote audiences. You can do it with people in a room as well. Um, last thing, accessibility. Again, been talking about this for quite a few years. Um, uh, you know, everyone you know, thinks, okay, we do W3, W3CA, whatever test, and that we need to do this for compliance with the ADA. Um, actually, uh, there is no, so um, apart from the moral obligation and apart from the legal obligation, um, it's been my experience over all my years that um, an accessible website performs better for all users. Um, if you can make your website work uh, for someone using voiceover, you can make your website site work for someone who's navigating only via a keyboard, you will solve a bunch of other accessible, uh, you know, basic usability issues that will improve your conversion, improve your quality for everybody who's there. Um, not least of which, search engines are visually impaired users who cannot navigate JavaScript and don't use a mouse. Um, and so uh, you will improve your... Uh, search engine rankings on whatever search engine comes in our great D-Web future after Google. I didn't want to name those specifically. Uh, back in the day, I used to get a guy and actually, um, uh, 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 the, he, he contacted us. We built this website. We thought we'd done really well. We'd won loads of awards on it. And he met, emailed us and said, uh, I, I can't uh, use a text-to-speech reader and I can't use your website. And um, uh, I said, OK, can you send me a recording? And he sent me a cassette tape of him browsing our website and we took that data and we fed it back in. So you can go, oh yeah, we tick all the validation stuff that this, you know, this other web form says we're fine. There is no substitute for listening to those recordings yourself and making your developers listen to them. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it's incredibly valuable and it's also doing the right thing. Um, in conclusion, uh, I think you know, technological idealism is great, but it's not gonna be enough. Um, we have to make our web simpler, more comprehensible, faster, kinder, and more fun. Uh, and we only do that by building usability and usability testing and observation into everything that we do. I think we actually have a huge opportunity here because the existing web is at its worst state that it's ever been, I think. Like the, uh, the, it's now actively user hostile. We have, you know, uh, the, the, you know, whether it's Amazon, whether it's Google, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Reddit, they're all now sort of coming out as openly um, uh, against what their users are interested in, against what the users are for, which means they're creating a usability space that we can take over and rush into and um, uh, ultimately win. Um, but one thing I didn't really get a chance to talk about business models, don't build your business model on advertising because
that way lies corruption and madness. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, objections, contradictions? In the front. Is there um, some sort of like online workshop to know how to become EDA compliant? Uh, uh, not one that I'm aware of, um, but um, there is a bunch of Mm, there's a, there is a bunch of writing out there, like if you Google for it. The, the, I mean, the, the main thing is like, don't just rely on getting a checkbox from, from, from somewhere, so. Hello. Hi, um, I was curious if you could speak a little bit about like the usability challenges you see as we introduce these new technologies, these centralized technologies that are like changing people's expectations, right? Like the constructs socially are different, how and what they're getting versus from a decentralized system versus a centralized system. Um, mm. um, I think... What was the question? Oh, uh... A, you, a request to comment? Yeah. <laughs> it was a request to comment. Um, just thinking about the usability challenges broadly that we face going into a decentralized um, technology versus... For the recording, a, uh, a, a, um, a, what are the challenges of uh, decentralized technology for usability versus before? I'm not sure that they're actually significantly different. I think we do have a whole bunch of, you know, anything with decentralized technology, the failure modes are different. And at the moment, the timing, so, so like the length of time you expect, uh, a big part of usability in the existing web is being faster to respond than than, than, than everybody else. Like there's a, loads of evidence that like, you know, b being a 10 millisecond website is better, more usable than being a two, two second website. I mean, that's, that's at the extremes. And because a lot of the decentralized things we're building either have much higher latencies or have a much, high, much greater variance between the high speed and the low speed or the longest it could possibly take in the fast one. Um, I, I think that creates a lot of, I've seen that create like confusion for users where they're quite familiar with a, a certain degree of performance that historically we've only been able to give people from, from, from centralized solutions. Um, that would be my main one. Um, if we have any further questions, we can take them privately. Thank you. Thank you.